Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for staying this late. I was wondering how many are going to show up, and uh, I had a bet with Roland here. I said one person will show up, and then it looks like uh, there are more people here. So thank you again. Uh, for you coming and staying at the end, I have a $100 voucher. Uh, so you're welcome to come and pick it up uh, if you stay through the session. So <laughs> it's $100 for your Azure consumption. So it's, it's a great way to get uh, developers started in Azure. Um, how many of you watched uh, Joseph's keynote this morning? Great. So he ended up with this AI is the new normal, and that's where I am continuing today. And in the interest of the time, I'm just going to start up with a story. We saw a kitty in the a dog and a kitty and so on and so forth. I'm going to start up with the story of snow leopards. So snow leopards are the ghosts of the mountains. They are the national animal for Kyrgyzstan and where they are being almost worshipped. So the interesting part about snow leopard is they are spanning about 2 million square kilometers in the Himalayan region. And then, if you look at them through a Google map, they are approximately in the span of about 12 different countries. So it's a very, very interesting animal. Why am I talking about snow leopard? And AI is the new normal. So let me come to that in a second. Unfortunately, the snow leopards are endangered species. There are about 3,500 or 3,600 to about 7,000 left in the wild. And it's been a problem for countries like Kyrgyzstan, where they are the national animal. And every day, a snow leopard is being killed. They are killed due to mainly three reasons. There is mining, uh, where the lands are taken out, and then this is causing the snow leopards to be extinct. Poaching, a lot of poaching, because there is a belief that Snow leopard bones are considered uh, good for medicinal uh, reasons, similar to the rhinoceros uh, nose and the elephant trunk and so on and so forth. And retribution killing. Retribution killing is when the farmers are worried about their animals and then snow leopard is killing them, so they want to really kill uh, snow leopard so that their goats and other animals that they preserve um, are being not killed by snow leopards. So, there is a trust called Snow Leopard Trust, which is a volunteer organization. And they are formed in 1981. And then they are essentially saving the snow leopards. They are uh, in the process of preserving snow leopards in the natural habitats. And they came to us and then said, can you help us to preserve snow leopard? But before you can uh, save the snow leopards, you must first find them. The interesting part about snow leopard is they are camouflaged. It's very, very hard to see them. So let's try a I spy game. Can anyone here find a snow leopard here? Anybody? Anybody could see? Somewhere? In the middle. OK. So let me see. Maybe you won the first one. So that's exactly where it is. And then if I zoom in a little bit more further, there they are. <laughs> maybe we don't need AI, so maybe just we need you. So, <laughs> so the, in the absence of him, how do you find the snow leopard? So, First one is GPS callers. They thought the GPS callers will help, and before AI, and then they started uh, collaring snow leopards. But the difficult part is, this is the terrain of Kyrgyzstan. You have to climb up, then you have to set up snow leopard traps, and it's really, really hard to do this. And then even if you find them, you have to be really careful in handling them and collaring them. So once you collar them, this is how uh, they look. And this is kind of the collars of the snow leopard. These collars, once it's done, then they are essentially able to track through the satellite. That's a fellow named Kostov. He's one of the uh, uh, members of the Snow Leopard Trust. He is, uh, he's got a PhD, uh, but most of his time is spent on tracking snow leopards as opposed to working on the conservation of the snow leopards. Once you start tracking this, 
you can really understand where they are across the Himalayan regions and you can do all kinds of real-time tracking. Howard, do you guys see a problem with this? Anyone see why this is an issue? Any guesses? That's correct. So it actually took nine years to call it 23 snow leopards. So there was a student, it's a real story, this is a student, he's a, from Sweden, he is a PhD student, spent about nine years collaring 23 uh, snow leopards. So, in, since it's not possible, they came up with another ingenious method. So they came up with selfie cameras for snow leopards. So these are camera traps. These have a long battery life. So once they are placed, they are motion sensors. So if you go stand in front of them, it takes pictures. Well, the issue really is, it not only takes pictures of the snow leopard, anything in front of them, it'll take pictures, like moving grass, goats, and everything, right? So the difficulty with uh, this is, there are, they place 300 camera traps. There are only five people in the entire snow leopard trust. And as I said, like host, most of the time is spent on looking at the pictures as opposed to doing the signs. So here is an example of uh, what happens with the camera trap. So let me go back to the previous pictures supposed to be an animation here, let's see. Hmm. Yeah. So you see a lot of these uh, pictures by these uh, camera traps, and then if you see there's more and more, and then some of the animation, okay, there you can see the bit of the animation. These are all stitched together. So you can see the movement of these uh, camera traps. So we were able to get a lot of the images. There are about 10 to 15 surveys for per year, each survey produces about 100K images, and then you look, 5% contains snow leopards, most of them contains grow, goats and grasses, 300 hours per survey, so if you multiply the 10 to 15 times like the number of surveys, it's about so many, 3,000 to 4,500 man hours just to classify these images. So instead of cost of using his PhD to advance the science, you're spending time in classification of these images just like most of us do manual work. So they came to us and then asked, hey, how can we amplify the productivity of these scientists and how can AI help? So one of the engineers in our team, who is really, really good at uh, these things, used a method known as convolution neural networks. How many of you are familiar with CNNs here? Very good, excellent. So you probably really immediately understand what I'm talking about here. So, for those who are not, these are not uh, difficult ones. So I'm, I know I'm talking to the developer audience here. So I'll, I'll talk through on how you can uh, use something like this. So essentially use the CNN method, and then if you look at the architecture of what he did, he essentially used a model that is available, a ResNet 50 model, and then he fed in snow leopard images, and then using the existing train, these models are already trained, they are trained for faces, and all those things. You essentially provide the snow leopard image and then use a decision tree and then take the last layer out and then you can identify snow leopard or not. Just like us, human beings, if you've never seen a snow leopard, if you see a snow leopard, you can really understand it's an animal and you can really understand its eyes and ears. The same thing, they use the similar techniques to understand this. So essentially got the classification done and we used Spark uh, in Azure to do this. And here is a architecture of how he did. So here is the lab I showed where cursed up the picture, he was looking at the satellite images of all the snow leopards. He's doing the same thing, except he's uploading the images to Azure, where we use AI to essentially classify all these images using the deep learning techniques in Spark, and then get the results out. So this is the kind of the high level architecture. Let me just play through the results of this in the video here. Can I get audio here? Give me one second, let me see if the audio works. The snow leopard is a big cat that lives in high altitude areas in Asia and Central Asia. This audio should work, I guess. Left in the wild. So their Can you guys hear the audio? Is an organization that's based in okay. Seattle. 
they The snow leopard is a big cat that lives in high altitude areas in Asia and Central Asia. Right now, we only have about 3,800 to 6,500 left in the wild. So their population is definitely in danger. The Snow Leopard Trust is an organization that's based in Seattle. They raise money for snow leopard conservation. Our main focus is community-based conservation. The way we attempt to count snow leopards today is through camera trapping. For a given survey, that can take up to 300 hours just for the sorting of the images. So our researchers are spending time doing that as opposed to actually doing science. Right now, we're in the process of taking some of our hundreds of thousands of pictures and we're building an ML model in Azure ML to be able to determine whether or not um, a given image has a snow leopard. That honestly will save us thousands of hours of our researchers' time. That's just invaluable for us. So this work is going to be featured in uh, National Geographic very, very uh, shortly, something that uh, saved about several hundreds of hours uh, for these researchers so that they can focus more on um, their research as opposed to uh, sifting through these images. So let's step back. As I said, why did I start with snow leopards, right? So they are cute, they are cuddly, and so on and so forth. But if you really step back and think, such kind of uh, research, such kind of AI-infused finding snow leopards or any of these things are not possible without the confluence of three things, the cloud, the data, and AI. So a cloud, if you think about it, is essentially where the ocean where AI is being born. Joseph talked this morning, there has been AI before. Machine learning has been in the industry for a long time. The reason it's just taking off really is mainly because of the cloud, where AI is being born. And all types and all shapes of behavior are being digitized with the data. So there are lots of data being coming in, and with the new advancements in algorithms, there is a huge confluence you're going to be seeing with the cloud data and AI and all industries of future are essentially going to be at this confluence of these things. So the rest of the talk is going to be on these three phases. I'm going to talk about cloud, I'm going to be talking about data, and then I'm going to be talking about AI. And then I do have a demo at the end. And there are some case studies and examples as I speak to each one of them. Um, cloud, um, uh, of course, I am biased. So I'm from Microsoft, so I'll talk a little bit about Azure. So, but here is the interesting quote, 1943. So, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. Do you think he's right? Yes? I think he's still wrong, because I think there's five plus. So if you think about the number of computers we have, these massive ones, and I missed uh, Alibaba, and I missed Oracle and others, and so on and so forth. I think there is world more than five computers. These are just cloud computers. So let's just run through each one of them, right? Um, we pride ourselves in providing developer tools. So if, if you look back, uh, when we started PCs, the reason it took off is because of a uh, lot of great developer tools. Started with Visual C++. Anybody remember in this crowd? Some people may not be born at the time. So, uh, so, so I'm dating myself by showing some of these things uh, from my days at Microsoft. Uh, these are a lot of compilers that we produced then came up with the consumer devices, Xbox 360, and so on and so forth. Now our developer platform is essentially cloud, Azure Cloud. So I'll just run through some of these things uh, on how we are advancing the Azure Cloud. So here is an image of one of the data centers so that is being uh, built. So if you take a flight and then go all the way to the other end, this looks something like this. Look at the size of the car at the bottom of these things. This is how these data centers are massive, right? Here's one of the largest in the Western United States. It's very, very close to uh, my office. It's about two hours away from Seattle. It's called Quincy, Washington. This is one of the generation one data centers. And then I think we have been continuously trading and progressing on these data centers. This is Cheyenne. It's another one in the United States. This is Dublin, um, which is growing. So you can see uh, the growth of the data centers. Amsterdam. Now, Amsterdam is very, very interesting. We have a data center right next, I don't have a picture of this. It's actually a greenhouse. 
So I always wondered, what do they grow in Amsterdam in a greenhouse right next to the data center? So, even better. We now have a data center. So this is kind of, I'm just showing the advancements of the data centers. Uh, this is an interesting one. About a year and a half, two years ago, we launched a data center under the sea. So I let this uh, particular one play a little bit so you can see how uh, it is being done. Uh, so this is done by Microsoft Research. So we launched a data center fully under the sea. Think about the massive buildings to how small the data center is. So you were able to pack a lot of our computing power into a very, very small uh, data center. And I, I'll let you watch a little bit because it's very, very interesting. I find it very interesting because just like when uh, the scientists launched the moon and then the, um, the moment of the launch, everything, you'll feel it like this because there is researchers very anxiously watching this and as it goes in and then the connections and then making sure it functions. So it'll come back in about 30 seconds. You'll see this. We have a deep sea diver to just goes in to make sure the data center is placed correct. And uh, and watch an exciting moment. I'm just letting it play because I want to see the. So here are the space launch the scientists sitting and watching this data center. Is it coming online or not? So you can see slowly everything is kind of uh, starting to pick up. Luckily, we didn't have the Houston, we have a problem situation here, right? Really took off, that one of the pictures was Peter Lee. And you can even see after a while, right, this is uh, later, uh, the habitats are even starting to allow, allow this data center at the uh, thing. So running this cloud is not an easy thing. Uh, we have these huge terrestrial and subsea cables that we run, uh, that way we lay around in the world. We have a collaboration with Facebook in terms of connecting the entire world. Here is a, a picture of about 1.8 billion miles of fiber in our data centers connected across the world. We have approximately 51 data centers, almost twice as much as AWS and Google combined. And uh, this is kind of the advancements of data center. Now, how is it helping developers? So here is an innovative company known as eSmart. How many of you heard about eSmart in the crowd here? Wow, no one. Okay, so this is a new th something you learned today. eSmarts is a startup, uh, a very developer-centric uh, cloud-bound company uh, based out of Norway. And uh, what they do is they come between the energy utility companies and the consumers. So they essentially provide optimized power. And one of the things they do is help inspect the power lines. And... Uh, the normal methods of inspecting the power lines are someone climbing the pole or through helicopters. The last thing you want to do is to send a helicopter next to a power line. So what they started doing is they, send, they use drones, and they use drones and they connect these drones to Azure data centers. Just like I showed the snow leopard images, they essentially take lots of images of these power lines. They use very similar techniques like CNN and RNN, and then they classify and then they understand whether there is a faulty in the power line or not. Their methods came very handy recently when we had a hurricane in the uh, US known as Irma. So let me just play a video on how they are uh, uh, enabled drones to help with hurricanes, and then I'll walk through the architecture a little bit. We got called down here by a utility company in Florida after Hurricane Irma, actually on our way from Hurricane Harvey down in Houston. So we drove over here and we are assessing the damage that Hurricane Irma caused on the, uh, in the Florida area. The client that we have here in Jacksonville is JEA and uh, so far everything's gone very well. It's, uh, it's interesting using cutting edge technologies uh, such as drones with uh, cutting edge technologies such as these mobile command centers that uh, eSmart Systems brings to the table. Uh, in conjunction with them, we are giving real-time live stream information back to uh, basically anybody back at the utility. Their data analytics are seamlessly integrated to uh, the Microsoft Cloud and are uh, able to create actionable intelligence uh, for the end users. The biggest way it benefits the community is to basically bring power back as fast as we can. So if that eliminates a linesman climbing up to lines or anybody basically going into an area that's not safe, 
Drones allow us access to areas uh, without putting a human in harm's way. The UAS use case is safety and being able to have an eye in the sky in a place where you wouldn't be able to safely put a manned aircraft or you wouldn't be able to safely put a human on the ground uh, to say inspect something in a traditional method. As this is the safest way to give this post damage assessment for the utility companies. So being able to uh, provide new types of uh, data intelligence to an end user. The data that we give to the company is all geolocated, so it's a very simple way for operators in the office to direct the linesmen of where they need to go fix and what parts they need, the crew that they need to get the power up as fast as possible, and this can all be done in real time. It's great to be able to uh, bring some sort of uh, new type of relief to a disaster area such as uh, where uh, Hurricane Irma hit in Florida. For those developer audience, so he, this is what they did. They sent a bunch of raw images from the drones. Essentially, they batch them up, and then they run Azure functions to split the images. And, uh, and then they essentially use uh, Docker, and then they also use to auto scale depending on the number of uh, tasks. The one thing about running drones is it's not going to be running uh, constantly. It's only run when there is in a situation, an emergency situation. So you fly the drone, so you use only the cloud as uh, per the need, right? So you can scale up and scale down very, very easily with this kind of architecture. And then once they process the images, uh, and then they classify the images, then they put it in co Azure Cosmos DB. And in, as I said, the benefits of the architecture are the same, are these, right? The elastic scale, the performance, right? With 1,000 scores, including 60 GPU nodes and 500 CPU nodes, we were able to process 180,000 images, right? Which normally a human will take about 50 per year. So it's very, very similar to the, the snow leopard, but in terms of just in different use case, very, very, very similar techniques, right? Then you can use cost effectiveness, containerization, and extensibility. So uh, this is kind of the architecture we are seeing more and more rapidly in, our, in Azure. So I talked about the cloud, the power of the cloud. I'm gonna talk about uh, very, very quickly about the data. You can uh, go see azure.com slash data. There's a tremendous momentum. I mean, I think other cloud providers can also talk about uh, similarly, but from on-premises, where we have SQL Server 2017, to all the way to the cloud, uh, we have a tremendous momentum that we are seeing. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to run through one uh, video on how our customers are using uh, these various types of data. So. What amazes me is how little hardware that we need. And we have literally saved millions and millions of dollars. Data is where it's at. It's the lifeblood of every company that's out there. The benefits we saw from the Azure migration was almost immediate. We were able to validate 28,000 invoices in less than two hours, which would normally take about two days. The analytics engine that's been built on the Azure cloud allows us to collect and analyze the data needed to deliver the insights our customers require to stay competitive. I get to use all the data, not just a subsample of it. It's increased our productivity by 50%. Azure Databricks is the best way to do Spark-based analytics, period. We use the Cosmos DB because it allows us to distribute the data models to be near the services wherever in the world they're deployed and Azure has delivered as a rock solid platform. One of the first tests of our new Azure implementation came with some breaking news. SpaceX just took off and Azure just scaled right up with it. So that was a very, very uh, quick tour of uh, uh, there because I want to spend more time on uh, AI. Um, so the last chapter of this uh, talk is uh, azure.com slash AI, but I'll be showing a demo. Uh, Joseph touched upon very highly the three AI services that's available in Azure. One is the pre-built uh, cognitive services. The second one is the Azure bot service for conversational AI. And the third one is the Azure machine learning. The best way to illustrate the power of this is using a demo. So uh, let me motivate the demo with, uh, uh, with a study. So this is a paper, uh, ChexNet, published by Stanford. Uh, this was published in November of last year. Uh, Stanford radiologists published a paper where they could identify 
14 different types of diseases uh, using just chest x-rays. And this is a, a very well-written paper published in Nature. Uh, they published the paper, but they did not publish the model. So what um, data scientists from my team did was they took this paper, they're able to recreate the model. Uh, not just recreate the model, we were able to actually perform better than uh, the Stanford radiologist's original uh, thought. So we came up with an app, uh, and then essentially, uh, let me switch here to HDMI 2, and hopefully I can run the app. So this is running in an iPad. This is not connected. So this is an edge device, which is not connected to internet. Uh, the reason this is very, very critical, because a country like Liberia, where there are only two radiologists, but if you take a hospital in Boston, there are 176 radiologists. So access to healthcare in a country like Liberia is very, very hard. So you essentially need something like this. So it typically takes them about four to five days to get any kind of uh, radiologist to even look at an x-ray in Liberia. So uh, an a, a edge device like this can help a doctor to at least to get the first level of the care. So this is a pocket radiologist app. Uh, hopefully it works. Maybe not, huh? OK. So there are two ways, right? One is you can uh, import an image, or if you have an x-ray, you can uh, show this as a camera and then take a picture of it. So I have a bunch of images uh, in there. So I'm going to go look at uh, photos. So there are a bunch of images that is already stored. Uh, these images are from National Institute of Health. These are publicly available images. So I just, I'm going to randomly pick any image here. And then you can do uh, done here. So what it's going to do is it's analyzing. It's running a model in the edge. And then it came up with the score for edema, 98% likelihood and 32% uh, the weight. And then you can actually hover over, and then you can see where the location is. So this is kind of a very, very first level. We are not replacing doctors. Just to be super clear, this is not uh, even blessed by any uh, medical uh, organization. This is essentially a proof of concept to showcase the possibilities of uh, uh, creating a machine learning model to do something like this. And then you can look at the other uh, areas of them. Uh, the app is actually built by um, uh, the, the, the development of this particular app. The visuals you're looking is built by uh, students of uh, Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, they are interns for a, uh, this December and January in Microsoft, so they came and built this app. The, they are developers, they are not machine learning uh, data scientists. So how did they develop? That's the power of right, right? They are able to quickly consume a model produced by data scientists, our data scientists, and built a UI like this, and they are able to kind of deploy in an edge device like this very, very easily. So this is kind of a uh, how we are deploying. So let me switch back and then showcase the architecture of how we did it. So here is the data prep stage. Yeah, almost done. I'll give me 30 seconds. Um, so we got about 112,000 images from the National Institute of Health, and then we are able to write the model. Uh, so this is the data scientist. It's a dense net model using Keras and TensorFlow. Again, Azure Cloud is an open source cloud, so essentially supports all kinds of developments like these. And then once you're done, that is the data scientist portion, then the uh, interns took it using Visual Studio tools for AI. And then uh, you can run these models in Azure GPU VMs. And then you can deploy in multiple devices, right? Since it's developed, it's a cross-platform app. You can deploy this in Docker containers and so on and so forth. This is what we did. What we did was with this device, this is an Apple um, uh, device. So we converted the model into core ML. So CoreML allows you to deploy the models in the edge. So that's what we did here. So this is kind of a write one, develop once, and deploy in many, many places. So data scientist portion comes there, and then the developer uh, split comes here. So this is kind of uh, the patterns that we are seeing. So let me uh, summarize in the interest of the time. Uh, AI is a new normal. We are seeing not just AI somewhere there. We are already seeing AI everywhere. The best way to illustrate this is with a, with a video. This is a very, very powerful one I saw. So let me play this video. I came to RIT because of the communication access that's provided here. We are the world's largest mainstream program for deaf and hard of hearing people. 
we have the world's largest interpreting services, as well as the captioning group. It's the largest, but we still cannot keep up with the growth and the need for access services. So we decided to use Microsoft Translator as an additional communication tool. As a deaf person, I want the exact same information that my hearing friends have. Presentation Translator was easier than we thought it would be. You really just have to click it, and the software automatically reads the content and everything that you have within the PowerPoint system. The Cognitive Services custom speech recognition is critical for capturing vocabulary words that wouldn't be necessarily conventional in everyday life. Students can pick any language that they choose to receive the information. If the professor has chosen English, which they speak, then I can choose whatever language I learn in best. Do you guys play any video games? Students can use the app to initiate a conversation with others. So now that I have my phone, I can see exactly what was said. There are barriers to communication everywhere, but I think it's time we look at the barriers as opportunities, and then they can be broken down. I came... With that, I'm going to ask you for a call of action today, which is becoming an AI developer. Uh, there is nothing preventing you. I have 100 bucks for each of you for patiently staying here all day. And then we have some resources at end. I will leave, leave the slide here. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, we won't do the questions because of the time. Yeah. Okay.